morning and uh, welcome everyone okay so let's pray and we'll begin this morning's class i'll just request uh, one of us here to please lead in prayer let's pray our holy father thank you lord thank you for this day and this time and thank you for this new life holy spirit father you have given us today we are gathering for your name lord you are going to us i send for hands lord Lead us, guide us, give your patience, give your understanding power, give your concentration, Holy Spirit, Father, may we understand your word. Lord, you talk with us through your words, and especially for your poor hands, in my son, your hands. Lord, you guide her, lead her, Father, she will teach us through your words. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sabita. Today, we'll move on to the next topic in our notes. This is in chapter 4. So far, we have uh, studied about an enemy that we have in Satan. And we also saw how uh, he functions, how his, um, um, like the other fallen angels of his kingdom, whom we call as demons, how they function, how the kingdom is structured and the kind of activities that they are engaged in. And we also saw that we generally call them by the activities that they do. Like if it's a deaf spirit, mute spirit, blind spirit, then we term them on the basis of what they actually do. So all that we have seen, now we will come to um, the methods that Satan uses. Generally, the methods that he uses are the same they have been the same through generations uh, and that is somewhat advantageous for us believers because when we see how satan has tried to tempt others we can prepare ourselves um, beforehand and be ready to overcome the devil so the methods of working of satan are somewhat similar over the ages let's quickly look at uh, uh, two verses one is second corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11 if someone is there you can please read that and then another person could please read ephesians 6 and verse 11 second corinthians Two verses eleven. Yes. So that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. Okay. So uh, could you please come again once again? So that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs ignorant of his designs okay so uh maybe you're reading a particular uh, version in the nkjv has anyone has nkjv version yeah okay nelson will you could please read an nkjv version what does it say lest satan should take advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his device device okay devices so basically the scripture is saying that when we are aware of the devices of satan we can overcome them so devices what does it mean devices simply means plot um whenever we play a game i i know uh, you know especially chess Okay, so when you're playing chess, sometimes we have all these ideas. If he does that, I'll do this. I'll do, you know, I'll kind of um, come to a checkmate in these ways. Like you have these plots in your mind. You have these options in your mind where you're thinking about defeating the enemy or de defeating your opponent in this case. So in the same way, what Satan does is against God's people uh, collectively as well as individually he has plots he's constantly thinking how can i get this person down okay his devices there are schemes there are ideas there are plots that satan has against all of us 
and collectively as a body as a people of god he has these ideas so that he can bring us down those are called as the devices of the devil you remember when we started discussing about believers authority we said we can make two mistakes in the case of the devil one is to say that uh, he doesn't exist so if we say he doesn't exist then in our minds we must also believe that there are no plots there's nothing which is coming against us so you know life is smooth plain and we can keep going as we wish the second error is to give him too much interest where we are thinking okay what are his plots what are his schemes so these two extremes have to be avoided somewhere in between where we know he exists he has certain plots um and uh, yeah he is a dangerous enemy but then with that in our minds we are wise in living our lives that is the in between place and that's the best place for us to live so notice we are told that there are certain devices or plans schemes uh, plots that satan has against us now let's look at ephesians 6 verse 11 Could someone please turn to this uh, and read it? Ephesians. Okay. Ephesians six uh, verse eleven. Yeah. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Okay. So it tells us we must uh, we must be clothed with the armor to overcome the wiles of the devil. what are the wiles of the devil the translation of that term wiles is methods of working okay usual techniques or usual um strategies that satan has we need to be aware sister can you please go back and read it again that line yes sister put on the whole armor of god that yeah. you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil okay so we are told that we have to put on the armor or in other words be prepared uh, to face all the methods of working of the devil all right so now let's discuss what are some of the methods that he uses what are some of the common methods that satan uses are you aware of any such methods sister operation uh operation how Oppres he oppresses the yes. people of god okay oppression oppression okay oppression is one method okay confusion okay very good any other methods uh, you may have known personally experienced sickness. or sickness sister sickness okay temptation fear sister fear fear okay okay deception doubt confusion okay any other common what what are some of his methods that he uses apart from what we just shared any anything more it's there in our notes so if you go back and look at the list you'll probably be aware so let me read it out for us it says temptation intimidation intrusion opposition deception oppression possession domination and empowerment we are going to look at each one one by one but before we get into it look at a, a chart that is included in our notes uh, and uh, for the sake of our e learning students i'm going to present my screen please give me a moment okay so i'm sure the e learning students can see the screen right now uh, so this is the chart that we are speaking about where 
there is a progression okay progression simply means it leads to an increase so notice the arrow it's going from influence to oppression to possession and finally empowerment when we look at aspects like influence and oppression what we understand is um satan is mostly afflicting someone externally external it's not within the person but these are external suggestions that satan gives and that's why we are calling first is influence uh, but when there's a strong influence it can become an oppression it can go to the next level so influence is mainly outside and uh, when we given to the influence of satan that's when we can go into the next level like slowly it leads to uh, oppression it may lead to possession and you know domination so influence is generally external so what are some of the influences that we may have temptation deception i can only hear shanshan because everything has a shan at the end here to be clearer for me to be able to hear you so which are the opposition okay opposition temptation yeah we already listed out temptation deception okay fine all right so all of these things now uh when it comes to the uh influence of the devil how to overcome the influence that we will study later but look at it like you know in a war situation when you have uh, enemies and they're shooting arrows at you they're all outside they're all outside us but it's coming to us uh, with us as the target so that's influence so satan is constantly trying to influence using any one of these methods when we consider the life of jesus jesus made a very important statement in um john 14 and verse 30 okay that this particular scripture you should never forget in believers authority so uh, let's turn to that scripture and then we will continue john 14 and verse 30 john 14 was 30 yeah i will no longer talk much with you yeah. for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me okay so uh, see the last portion of that verse jesus is talking about satan and the rule of satan and he's saying that no matter what satan does he has nothing in me okay he has nothing in me that means that even if satan influences jesus was living in such a way that satan could never get a hold of jesus okay you remember the example which we gave for beels above we said if there is a plate of leftover food uh, which is rotting then the bees can come and attract so if there is something that allows the enemy to take a hold in our lives then he can come and he can influence we sometimes use the term open door if there is an open door open door can be sin open door can be a thinking pattern open door can be you know a certain lifestyle there are so many things which are an open door now if there is an open door then satan can influence strongly he can take us to the next level but if there is no open door then he cannot so that is why what is jesus saying he's saying the ruler of this world is coming but he has nothing in me meaning there's no open door there's no uh, there's no hold right and uh, so i'm safe you know in a sense that's what jesus was saying satan cannot touch me satan cannot influence me he cannot work through my life 
because there is nothing in me there's no sin uh, you know there's there's no guile there's no evil in me so that's a tall order it's a challenge whenever we talk about believers authority we only think about commanding the devil right commanding the devil and rebuking the devil casting out demons yes all that is there but the first thing is our relationship with god if there is nothing hindering our relationship with god if things are pure if things are clean then automatically we are walking in great authority before the devil you got it an intimate life a holy life a righteous life satan can't even touch us because there is no uh, open door into our lives so always remember this believers authority is not just about rebuking devils it's about walking right with god and that's the example jesus gave us he said satan has nothing in me john 14 verse 30 satan has nothing in me okay so that will help us overcome the influence of the devil how do we um what is another way to overcome i stated right uh, the attacks of the devil are like arrows it's coming at us how are we going to overcome that okay resist ha huh. put on the armor of god his word declaring his uh, precious blood at the cross yeah declaring his word so that's also fine um declaring his word now i'm asking us when the arrow comes is there any part of the armor which we can hold up against the attacks shield okay so what is the shield that we have faith correct so even when we walk by faith it becomes very difficult for the enemy to attack us because we are constantly trusting god we are constantly holding on to god okay so uh, that is a little bit about the first aspect which is influence now in the image here yeah we'll move on we'll move on from here uh, influence we will move on to oppression now under influence many of the um external suggestions have been included things like temptation deception intimidation intrusion and opposition each one we will come to it that time we will understand properly what they all mean but for right now they are all influences then second is oppression oppression is when uh, it is affecting us affecting us mentally affecting us maybe even physically right uh, so that is oppression so it can turn into a sickness it can turn into depression it can turn into some sort of a, a strong hold or a, an emotional bondage so all these things can happen that is called as oppression so as there is a progression of the demonic influence it becomes a little more challenging to set the person free if somebody is in the area of influence they come to us and say uh, okay pastor I, i'm going through this temptation i want to overcome we can counsel them we can give them from the word of god the steps they can take the scriptures they can quote it's a little bit easier to come out of temptation now if they have already gone to the next level they gave into the temptation again and again and now they are in the place of oppression oppression maybe by now they have developed some mental patterns it's more difficult to break that okay are you, are you all understanding it's just getting deeper basically so when it comes to our intervention also uh, it it will take greater faith it will take more steps a better counsel and all that to help the person become free so oppression they can be in uh, you know sickness or depression some bondage and we have to bring them out of that now if the person continues in that level oppression then comes the level of possession okay what is possession possession is when the demons actually occupy the the a, a person's um yeah spirit 
right spirit and mind they can just take over they can take over and uh, they can actually work through the person that's what possession is all about right and possession can be uh, like let's say only some times or it can be all the time so we see situations where uh, somebody is possessed but they will not manifest throughout now they let's say they come to a church service or somebody prays then the person starts to manifest but actually they are possessed okay uh, but there are times when a person manifests all the time if you go back to um, uh, in the bible legion you remember there was a man he was outcast and he was put uh, asked to live in the uh, like the burial place because it was very difficult for people to control him you know violent and uh, just uh, how do you say like not very civil right uh, so they they said okay fine you don't even live with the people you just go stay out because he probably was manifesting all the time and his he was not mentally stable right uh, so these things happen sometimes the demon possession is so strong that the individual may not be like con sort of uh, uh, sane or conscious or be able to continue doing life the normal way so then when we minister to them that will be a completely different thing why are we understanding the levels of influence so that we know how to help them okay that's the point so sometimes people can be possessed and uh, that may show some uh, you know parts of the uh, of worship or any any time it may manifest but there are times when a person can be completely overcome by the demons and uh, manifest the whole time okay that can happen now even beyond the possession there is one level and that is known as empowerment okay empowerment all this is there in the um the graph or the chart here and i will explain it for us little more so possession i think we have all understood uh, we've all understood influence we've all understood oppression okay quite easy then uh, possession we've understood yeah now coming to empowerment empowerment is when uh, there is a person who is demon possessed but the demons are now using that person as um, a tool or they are working through that person to gain more control so who who comes in the category of empowerment you know sometimes we have people who have <laughs> practiced witchcraft all these uh, occultic arts and all that and they have become so strong and uh, deeply connected to the demonic world that they act as mediums between the demonic world and the natural world you know they may uh, they may propagate they may kind of cause some communication to happen or some transfer of power so they try to take the power from the demonic world and then they use it on many people such individuals are generally empowered by demon spirits uh, so if you go back to the book of acts okay acts uh, i think chapter 13 over there paul meets uh, one official sergius paulus while he's trying to share the gospel he's not able to because there is a man there's a sorcerer who is stopping this person from receiving the gospel right his name was El elimus bar jesus and so paul first had to overcome the power of this man the sorcerer before the gospel could be revealed right to the 
uh, individual that he was ministering to. So the sorcerer was that person with empowerment at that point. Now you find many such examples. If you go to Acts chapter 8, there is a name, uh, there is a person by the name of Simon, Simon, the sorcerer. Simon was so powerful in the in the demonic, in the occultic things that people used to call him God. He can do, he used to do so many miracles, wonders, and uh, people would be like, wow, how, how does this man do all these things? But the answer is, there is, a, there is another source. Uh, people can do supernatural works, but from the wrong source. Okay, so Simon the sorcerer, he was also uh, someone who was empowered by demons. So like that, even today, we may find that there are people who go beyond that level of demon possession. They become an instrument in the hands of demons to uh, control many people. And uh, why do they do it? There can be so many reasons. Maybe they want power, they want money, they want fame. Uh, you know, they, they want so many things. And when they are greedy after those things, they don't mind going the wrong way through the demonic. So that is what empowerment is all about. So these are the levels. Now, when we talk about increasing, um, going under the influence of Satan and demons, for us as believers, another thing that we have to clarify is a believer can never be possessed. Okay? Let's get that straight in our minds. A believer can never be demon possessed. Why? Why can't we be demon-possessed? Sister, because the Holy Spirit uh, lives in us, inside of us. Yes, Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And uh, that's what Akil was saying. He who lives in us is greater than he who is in the world. So when we study scripture, we are told that we are the temple of the living God. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. We are the temple of the living God. When we say that there is a temple, what is a temple? What is a temple? Yeah, it's where God dwells. Or we can also put it as God's house. God lives there. And the Bible says that we... Collectively, as believers, we are the temple. And also, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Okay, That means God is living. When God is living, how can demons live? Either God or demons, right? So, God is living. Therefore, demons cannot live in our spirit. That is why a believer can never be demon-possessed. We don't have to be afraid of being demon-possessed. Ephesians 3.17, there's another verse also. It says, Christ dwells in our hearts. Christ dwells in our hearts. That again is an assurance that we can never be demon-possessed. All right. Um, Fine, so that we have understood. But after having said this, you know, can um, do we notice that people come under strong demonic influence? Believers, yes. So we are we are saying that God lives inside us. Christ dwells in our hearts. Uh, a believer cannot be demon-possessed, then what is this influence? How can they be so influenced? <laughs> Correct. Yes. 
Yeah. So most of the time in the lives of believers, how Satan affects us is he literally needs our permission. Without our permission, he cannot do anything in our lives. So Ephesians 4.27, it talks about a foothold. Don't give the devil a foothold. Foothold, again, is an open door. It's some space that we give the devil in our lives by the choices, the decisions, the behavior, the lifestyle that we carry. So when we allow him, we give him the foothold or the open door, that's when he can come in and he can influence us. Okay, so don't give him a foothold. What will he do if he comes? The Bible already says he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So there will be destruction as a result of uh, Satan influencing us. Okay, uh, so this is how demons can influence a believer, only if we allow them to. And I think in the last class, I also shared with us that the influence of the devil, <coughs> uh, particularly when demons have taken charge in a believer's life, we call it demonization. We don't call it demon possession. So we should never say when we look at any believer, uh, even if they are manifesting, sometimes demonized believers can manifest like demon-possessed unbelievers. But even then, it is not demon possession. We should never say demon possession for a believer. Okay? So demonization may happen. Manifestation may happen. But where are the demons taking charge? I explained that it's in the mind. Okay, In the mind, the demons can come and uh, they can sort of occupy the strongholds. They can occupy the strongholds uh, that have developed over a period of time with the believer walking in sin continuously and uh, you know uh, maintaining that wrong lifestyle. Demons come, they take charge. And that is the stronghold. Now, what did we say earlier? When we are at the level of influence, it's easy, like when we are just trying to overcome temptation, when we are just trying to overcome some kind of an accusation, deception of the devil, it's a little easier. But if the person has been under the influence and is, let's say, oppressed now, right, to a greater degree, they have the influence of demons, it's a little more difficult. Okay. So in the same way, when they have progressed so much, even as a believer, when they have progressed uh, in the wrong lifestyle um, or you know not had faith or not meditated in the word of god strongholds are created and demons take charge so at that point how are we going to minister to this believer it will look a little similar to how we are going to minister to unbeliever we'll have to cast out the demons cast out the demons from believers okay cast it out and then also help them as far as uh, you know their minds are concerned. We'll have to pray with them, teach them the word, help them re-establish themselves in the word of God. So then when the, the strongholds are broken, then there's no place for the demons to come back. So that's how it works. But we'll go into deliverance a little bit later. I just shared all this for us to gain a better understanding. Uh, yes, Akhil, Mike, please. So how do you uh, differentiate between uh, demonization and manifestation? See, demonization, <laughs> manifestation is what? Manifestation is uh, uh, how, you know, demonization presents itself. Okay? Like, um, we, we may have a demon possessed man screaming or shouting, like how legion like i'm going back to the same example there was certain behavior which was obvious and visible that is what we call as manifestation okay uh, demonization is the person can be demonized but they may or may not manifest they may not manifest also 
But is there a demon? There is. So manifestation is when we can see that person presenting. The demon is presenting itself by what it does. That is manifestation. So basically what we are uh, discussing here is like a believer need not be demonized. He 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 uh, he cannot be demonized, but he can manif be a victim of manifestation by his or her uh, activities or the yeah. So see, there are a couple of words. I'll just clarify it again. One is demon possession, which we will never use for a believer. Okay, that is out. Now coming to the other two uh, things here. One is uh, demonization. Demonization. Demonization means that a believer has demons okay manifestation manifestation means the demons are showing themselves uh, i'll just give you some examples like um, you know they the demons are there and they may do something yeah like activities like being violent or screaming, shouting, falling down, uh, or <coughs> you see all kinds of things. I've seen people uh, ride like snakes, right? Like they're people, but they're just moving like a snake. And uh, you're like, what is going on? It's a manifestation. There's a demon. It's causing those things. Uh, uh, once I saw uh, there was one girl, uh, and she just didn't stop making different poses. Like she was like uh, behaving like a dancer. And she was constantly making poses. Uh, this was a meeting. We had gone for a meeting. It was a youth meeting, in fact. And uh, she just didn't stop doing that. So different pastors were just going, and they were praying to cast out the demon. So when the demon shows itself through these activities, that is what we call as manifestation. Now, manifestation alone is not the... Uh, you know, the thing that reveals there's a demon. The person who has a demon may not even be manifesting. They can be so quiet also. So don't go by the manifestation as such. But yes, sometimes it's very obvious. We notice the manifestation and we can tell. Okay. All right. Is everyone fine with that or any any other questions around what we've just discussed? OK. So far, so good. OK, then um, we can move on to the next topic here. I don't think we'll be able to complete it because we have like about five, six minutes left. So let's start it. Then we can come back and discuss. So one of the influences that Satan commonly uses is temptation. And we are all familiar with temptation. What is temptation? Temptation is uh, Satan trying to suggest and attract us into sin. So that is what? temptation is. Uh, he will present things in such a way that it will be so exciting. Uh, and he wants to lure us or he wants to draw us into doing those things which will lead to destruction. When we think about temptation, you know, it can be quite hard. It can be very difficult to go through temptation. There are temptations of all kinds. Okay. We'll come to it later on. But one of the realities in scripture is that even Jesus went through temptation. You know, sometimes we say that, uh, oh, it's so hard to be a human being. It's so hard to go through the challenges of being a human being. What does God know? You know, God may, God doesn't know anything, what I'm going through. But that would be incorrect because we know that Jesus also was tempted. Satan never spared Jesus. 
do you know any uh, stage or point in jesus's life where he was tempted <laughs> Forty days, yeah. When he fasted for forty days, then Satan came, and then he was tempting him uh, regarding uh, power, right, and fame. Like I will give you everything, you follow me. So he tried to tempt him with fame and power and authority. But thank God, Jesus knew the word. The word was in him, and then he kept saying, "No, it is written. It is written." And Jesus overcame the temptation. Even when we look at um, the Garden of Gethsemane, think about this. Jesus came to a point where he said, "Is it possible to change this plan?" He asked God. So he must have been through a lot of um, pressure, right? Emotional struggle, mental, um, you know, like difficulty, challenges. To think that he has to go through so much pain and affliction. Okay. Uh, but then, thank God, he overcame. So Jesus also went through temptations. When we read in the book of Hebrews, we find that scriptures tell us that he was tempted in every way, yet without sin. So that is a great lesson for us. It's a great example, a great pattern before our eyes that the Lord Jesus, even though he went through temptation all kinds of temptation what is is a lesson for us to take from his life he never sinned so these are two things two separate things we can be tempted but we need not sin temptation itself is not sin you got it when we are being tempted and we may be struggling under that temptation that itself is not sin but when we yield to the temptation that is sin so Jesus also was tempted, tempted at all points. But what is the lesson? Okay, what is the encouragement from his life? He was sinless. So that helps us to know that, okay, even if Satan or his demons tempt us, we can overcome, right? We can live an overcoming life. Fine. So uh, let's stop at this point. Uh, let's take a break. We will come back and we will study more about temptation and other influences. <laughs>